So this is a 56-year-old patient who presented with de novo ER positive, HER2 negative, metastatic breast cancer. The HER2 is IHC1+. And she was metastatic to the bone, which was biopsy proven in 2018. She was started at that time with letrozole and palbociclin. And five years later, so very good uh, duration of response on this therapy, she had progression both in the bones and in the liver. At that point, a plasma NGS panel was done and that showed an ESR1 mutation, a D538G mutation. And so the question is, what is the best next treatment option for this patient? Should we be thinking about trastuzumab deroxycan because she's IHC1 plus? Should we be offering capecitabine? Should we offer her alpelisib with fulvestrant or should we offer her elacestrant? Can you uh, elaborate a little bit about the type of mutation that she has there? Right. So the most common ESR1 mutations that we see in clinic are D538G and Y537S. We do see other ESR1 mutations as well, but these two are the most common ones that are detected in most of the NGS panels. And so this is not very surprising that this patient who has had a CDK4-6 inhibitor and aromatase inhibitor for five years that under the selective pressure, they developed a ESR1 mutation. And we know that the prognosis of a de novo patient is probably better than a locally recurrent tumor. And so this is truly an endocrine sensitive tumor that under the selective pressure also developed ESR1 mutation, which is one of the most common kinds of ESR1 mutations. Can you talk a little bit about uh, where the tumor was, what kind of symptoms, if any, she was having at that point? Yeah, so I think the tumor had progressed in the bones and there were two new liver lesions. The liver lesions were small, about one and a half to two centimeters. And we had done a NGS panel at that time because she was reluctant to do a biopsy uh, in the liver or in the bone. The bone biopsy last time that she remembered or recalled having was painful and she didn't want to go through it if it was possible. So that's why we chose to do a plasma NGS panel and, and detected this ESR1 mutation uh, in that NGS panel. But she was otherwise very asymptomatic. Had it not been for the scans, it's not like she had increased bone pain or clinical pain that would have led to uh, a diagnosis of uh, looking for this. This was something that we were routinely doing every few months. Her markers actually were also uh, that I was following because she had made markers when she was de novo metastatic and had come down with therapy, remained uh, undetectable at this point. But radiologically, we did see that um, there was growth. I'm curious what you actually recommended to her and whether it might have been different if she had been highly symptomatic or had a lot of liver, more, say more liver disease and more visceral disease. Yeah, no, I think, again, a great question. So I did offer her LSS trend because this happened when LSS trend was approved and I had that option to offer that patient. And I was extremely excited about that exploratory analysis. We discussed about duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy and how single agent LSS trend yielded 8.6 months in that analysis. And so I was uh, happy to offer that to this patient who was otherwise asymptomatic to maintain her quality of life with low grade nausea, if anything, uh, with LSS trend. If this tumor would have had other alterations or if this tumor um, had led to more symptom, um, I would have still discussed this given the durability of the first line response with her and kept a close eye on um, uh, these um, uh, liver lesions by repeating scans, maybe you know in eight to 10 weeks rather than three to four months, which is when we usually think about doing this to make sure that the, uh, things are headed in the right direction. But if she was truly in, in a visceral crisis, if you will, so if she was symptomatic, the disease burden was super high in the liver, her LFTs were completely deranged, I would have then thought about chemotherapy and maybe even uh, resorted to weekly paclitaxel in that case, uh, if not capecitabine. That's a great point. Um, would you have thought through it differently if she had either a PIC3 mutation or an AKT alteration? Yeah, again, a great question. Fortunately, when we think about both ESR1 and PIC3 or AKT alterations, that's about 12% of our patient population. So when we think about ESR1 alone, we're saying about 40%, depending on when we catch them, 30 to 50% is what I think the range is, depending on if you see them in the second line or the third or the fourth line. When we're thinking about PIC3 mutations per se, we're thinking about 30 to 40%. AKT is in a single digit about 5%. So I think overall that pathway mutations, if you think about P10, AKT, PI3K combined, it's about 45, 48%. Together, they're 12%. We don't really have data to suggest that 
what should be the sequence if patients have both these alterations? Meaning, would they benefit better if we give them LSSTRAN first? Or should we give them a PI3K inhibitor or an AKT inhibitor with fulvestrin first and do LSSTRAN after? So we really don't have that data. But maybe a discussion about looking into what is the disease site? What was the durability of response from prior therapies? Is the patient really symptomatic? Can we have a discussion about the toxicity profiles of these drugs with our patients and really have a patient-physician shared decision process is how I think about this. Because if quality of life is important, toxicity is a concern, which is not trivial with targeted therapies in terms of what kind of toxicities they can have. And the other clinical parameters favor the analysis that we have with LSS trend. I think it would be reasonable to consider LSS trend first and then think about a combination therapy as a third line option should the tumor progress on LSS trend. So, um, let's see, there's one other thing I was thinking about with this. Oh, I'm curious. I'm guessing the patient's on LSS trend. How's she doing? She's doing great. And she actually has remained on them. This is her probably sixth month right now. Um, she's tolerated very well, does not require any antiemetics, mild nausea, some days, not every day, and has been tolerating it really, really well. Is very happy with her current regimen. I don't know if she actually was having tumor-related symptoms, but if she was, like in the bone, did that get better? Yeah, she did not have any. I have had another patient who I offered LSS trend to with some bone pain, and her hip pain actually started resolving within three to four weeks of initiation of therapy. Interesting. All right, let's go to the next case. Let's move on to case number two. So this is a, a, a Taiwanese woman, 49 years of age currently, past medical history of anxiety and insomnia, which is controlled. She originally presented to an outside institution in 2011 with a left-sided cancer, which was ER positive, and HER2, which was negative, so 2 plus but fish non-amplified, status post lumpectomy, central node dissection, and radiation. Her oncotype score was really low. She was on tamoxifen and received that from 2011 to 2015, at which point she was diagnosed with a right-sided, so contralateral DCIS. Again, had lumpectomy at that time, radiation, and then was put on raloxifene therapy, which she was on for three years when she actually was seen at Memorial. At that time, she was 43 years when she came to our institution. She was at that time found to have a mass in the ipsilateral side. So the left side again, there was a suspicious mass on imaging and that led to a biopsy that confirmed that this was cancerous. It was moderately differentiated invasive ductal. It had DCIS as well, so a new cancer, 95% ER, 98% PR. HER2, 1 plus, key 67 was 5 to 10%. She also had a staging scan done at that time, given that this was uh, you know, a new focus again on the left side, which unfortunately did show some findings in the liver and also in an endometrial cavity. We did more workup for the endometrium that was benign really, chronic changes and squamous metaplasia. We initially did a liver biopsy, which turned out to be benign, so we were not sure. It was FTG AVID, but because we missed it, we repeated a PET scan again at that time. Again, persistent FTG activity. This time, we did repeat a liver biopsy again. And that liver biopsy in March of 2018 confirmed that this was metastatic disease. It was adenocarcinoma, grade 2, compatible with her primary, ER 99%, HER2 negative, AR was also tested, which was 99%. She was started in 2018 with letrozole and palvociclin. She was on it for nearly 31 months before she had progression in the liver. So this was, again, the liver that acted up, did not have derangement of liver function tests, did not really have symptoms. We did do a liver biopsy in November of 2020. We ran a NGS panel using our in-house assay, the MSK impact assay. There was an ATM mutation, a GATA3 mutation, and TBX3. No other alterations. Genetic testing did not reveal any BRCA mutations. We also ran a plasma NGS to ensure there was no ESR1 mutations. There were no ESR1 mutations detected at that time. At that time, we had the phase one Ember trial study that was open for enrollment. So we enrolled her into the Ember trial, and she got the Imuna strand oral CERD and stayed on it for nearly two years, so, or nearly over a year, no, two years, as we see, November 2020 to December 2022, which is when she again progressed in the liver. 
She tolerated treatment well with grade one nausea and diarrhea, requiring some antidiarrheals once in a while um, if she had to maybe go out or something, but not on a daily basis and did really well on this therapy for a long time. Just amazing, uh, uh, the, the, the case. One thing about this case that's kind of interesting is the high AR. How often do you see that and how does that fit into the, this, the whole concept of what you've been talking about, if at all? Right, right. So AR and ER actually kind of go hand in hand a, a whole lot, meaning you will see a lot of AR positivity in ER positive, strongly positive tumors. So it's not very uncommon to see that. Um, we have some trials. Um, there was one interesting drug, Inobosarm, um, and that showed some data in the ER positive space and, you know, is being evaluated in phase three trials for the same. We've looked at antagonists like bicalutamide and zendolutamide, um, which have not necessarily panned out as great, um, but there has been activity that has been reported out from those trials. Unlike triple negative breast cancer, where AR really is also being evaluated in phase three um, with uh, these drugs, where you would see a slightly different. So you would see the luminal AR kind uh, phenotype of triple negative that will have AR positivity, but not all triple negative breast cancers. But unlike that, ER and AR are kind of co-expressed and you can see a whole lot of that um, uh, uh, ER activity with AR. Okay, let's go to your last case. So my last case, a 60 year old woman and at age 40 had DCIS, which was treated with lumpectomy and radiation. In March of 2017, had bilateral mastectomy and right central lymph node biopsy. The right-sided breast showed a 1.1 centimeter moderately differentiated IDC, ERPR positive at 50% and 30%, HER2 low at one plus. Node negative oncotype score was low at six, she was started on tamoxifen, which she received from April 2017 to January 2020. She was switched over at that time to um, exemestane, however, did not tolerate it due to arthralgia, so went back on tamoxifen. She then palpated a right breast mass. Ultrasound showed a 1.2 centimeter by 2 centimeter complex mass, biopsy of which in 21 showed IDC grade 2, which is ER 100%. PR 80%, HER2 that is negative by FISH. MRI confirmed the two centimeter mass and some indeterminate liver lesions. PET scan done in February 21 confirmed the hypermetabolic liver lesions, periportal nodes, lytic bone metastases, and MRI was done at that time due to headaches, which was negative. She did have a lot of bone pain from this lytic bone metastases, so did receive palliative radiation to the right hip. She did have a biopsy from the bone that confirmed metastatic disease. Again, ER 80%, PR here was less than 1%, HER2 non-amplified. So this is truly a first line case, right? So this was DCIS and then now newly presented with metastatic disease in 2021 in the right breast that has spread to the liver. So this was post AI, but presented now with metastatic disease. So she was started on oral served with abemaciclib here. So this is not first line, this is second line, um, I apologize. So this is post um, adjuvant therapy. She received this, but has biopsy proven uh, cancer in the liver and bone. And she was enrolled on imunestrant with abemaciclib on the clinical trial and remains on trial uh, to date. So she started in April of 21 and she was last seen uh, this month actually um, uh, and, and remains on trial. This is 24, not 23. So just tracking back, her uh, first-line therapy for metastatic disease was what? Exemestane or, uh, or Tamox? So she progressed on Tamoxifen. And that's why she was enrolled on the oral serve with abemaciclib because that was allowed. Right. Okay. And then can you t talk a little bit about, I've had enough trouble trying to figure, honestly, to be honest, I try to be honest about these things. I think everybody else feels the same way a lot of times, but I always, I'm still perplexed about how CDK works. And I'm really perplexed about what would happen if you take CDK and add in a CERD like immunolestrin biologically, like what do you think happens? So if you think about ER, ER is downstream of CDK4-6. And if I were to just think about a linear tree, you think about PI3K, AKT right up top. You do see CDK4-6 CDK here, and then you have ER. 
And I think it's a complex cascade, right? They're all kind of, when, when you think about CDK4-6, you know, these are kinases that are activated in ER positive tumors. And they have mechanisms through the retinoblastoma protein. We know the retinoblastoma protein is a tumor suppressor gene. And so what retinoblastoma proteins are doing is they are unleashing the gates of the cell cycle and making the cell cycle proliferate really rapidly. And that retinoblastoma is doing that because of the upregulation of cyclin D1 in ER tumors, which then interacts with CDK4 and 6. And that, along with the retinoblastoma, is really making the cycle go in proliferation. So if you inhibit the CDK4 and 6, you're putting breaks back on the retinoblastoma. You are actually putting a break on the cell cycle again and preventing this proliferation. And you want to try and do that along with endocrine therapy so that you can have a comprehensive blockade or down regulation of the ER pathway activation. So that's what you're trying to do by combining these drugs. Now, oral certs, if they are a good way of targeting the ER, better than, say, AI or better than, say, tamoxifen, which is why we're studying the them the way that we are, the hope is that maybe we'll block this even better, more comprehensively, because we'll degrade and antagonize the ER, and we'll also take care of the mechanisms of resistance to the cyclin D, CDK4, 6, RB by combining them. And this is why this patient was treated with the oral CERD and amacyclib. This was thought to be a good combination of a CDK4, 6, and ER-based therapy when her tumor progressed on adjuvant endocrine therapy. And, and as we've seen in these trials, that these patients do well with these combinations, this patient has remained on therapy um, uh, since 2021. I think, you know, we talk about all these new drugs and we talk about all these clinical trials that are ongoing or being planned, but I think uh, what is really, really the goal here is to try and improve outcomes for our patients. We cannot thank them enough to really trust us to be able to enroll on these trials, get access to these drugs and the families who support them. So I think that is what really inspires all us, uh, all our investigators to really think about developing these new drugs for our patients to improve outcomes. So I think a big thank you goes to them. And you know, the great thing is like you think about the patients you presented today, this is not just a question of trying to help future patients. A lot of people benefit by being in trials and you presented a couple of patients as examples of that. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about this uh, survey we did of clinical investigators, of 20 clinical investigators. You can see we have some uh, pretty uh, prominent people there. So I want to try to compare notes with this group and you in terms of how you think through various situations. Uh, so just sort of as a background, I know we're going to focus on SIRS, but uh, just a couple of questions we asked. You know, we always ask, we've been asking this for a long time which is preferred CDK in the premenopausal patient and in the postmenopausal patient. And I guess everybody's still into the survival benefit, although Abema looks like it's coming up a little bit. Any thoughts? Yeah, no, I think, you know, pre-ASCO two years ago, when we saw the lack of overall survival with Paloma 2 is when really the practice pattern started changing. So I think, you know, while we do not have any head-to-head -head trials comparing the three drugs, and we never will necessarily have that data, what we've consistently seen across the Mona Lisa program, whether it's Mona Lisa 2 and 3 in postmenopausal women, first or second line, Mona Lisa 7 in pre- or perimenopausal women, and now we also have seen early state signal from Natalie, we're seeing this consistent overall survival benefit with ribocyclib, which was really not the primary endpoint. Um, when we look at the primary endpoint of PFS, that was identical. The hazard ratios were same for all three CDK4-6 inhibitors. But despite not requiring the overall survival, the consistency of overall survival in the Mona Lisa pro program made people wonder, why not ribocyclib, right? When you have a patient in front of you, why not offer them this drug? And that's why I think the practice patterns have kind of tilted or shifted favoring ribocyclib. Again, I don't think that I don't like the other drugs. It's just that you have consistent, uh, you know, overall survival data. And so that has made me sway my practice as well. And I do offer ribocyclin. Feel very comfortable to switch over to the other two for toxicity reasons or any preference reasons if patients might have any. But otherwise, my go-to has been ribocyclin since that data set. You know, and it's interesting, and you know, this story has been evolving over the last year or two. And 
And Bama's starting to get some, you know, interesting looking data in terms of survival. And poor Palbo is lying down there, uh, maybe not getting used as much. But I started hearing a lot more about talking about Palbo after you presented your triplet study <laughs> at San Antonio. And people are like, whoa, wait a minute. Now, Palbo, that might be better in a triplet because it's better tolerated. So we could spend another hour talking about that study. But I just, you want to just wedge that in because I know it's just so interesting, that study. You know, we talked I, about it right before you presented it. Right. No, thank you for bringing that up. I, I do think I was such a Pablo user um, and I really was very, you know, it took me a week to to get out of my denial and my depression of the data of why I should be switching my practice because I really enjoyed giving my patients Pablo cyclic. And I haven't changed any patients who stay on Pablo and have derived benefit have not switched my ongoing patients. So there are many patients I still have in my practice on palbociclib. I personally really do not think that palbociclib is that inferior. I do not think that one drug is way superior than the other. I think I'm just challenged with, if I have a woman sitting in front of me and we talk about the data that exists, how can I ignore the overall survival data and not offer that? I still discuss the toxicity profiles. I discuss that. And then I offer ribociclib. But I do think that when we're thinking about triplets and the triplets, we always have the skepticism, right? Because the more drugs you add, the more toxicities obviously you're going to naturally get. Yes, you will get more efficacy, but you're going to get more toxicity. And clearly the least amount of monitoring and the least amount of toxicities that we have seen to date with the CDK4-6 inhibitor has been palbociclib. And if you were to take a survey only in Florida, for example, right? I'm just giving one example of a state. You will see a lot more Pablo users there than ribociclib even today. And the reason for that is that older patients, which is what we see in Florida, have more medications that they're taking. And if they're taking more medications, the risk of QTC prolongation or concurrent issues with you know, two drugs causing interactions is much higher. And with palbociclib, we don't have to worry about that. With ribociclib, there is a worry about QTC prolongation. So I still think that there is variations in practices. If you go ex-US, there is still variations in practices, uh, you know, depending on what country you, you're going to survey. I don't think we've all necessarily settled into one. And we go back and forth about our thought process. We first said all are the same. Then we started saying there might be some differences. We're going back to the idea that they're kind of same. We're never going to know this. I think we might have to use all of them in different contexts. So uh, actually, I want to throw in a question that just popped into my head. It has nothing to do with anything, but relates to something I heard, believe it or not, in myeloma that made me think about this, which is, because I've been wanting to ask somebody this, do you see more neutropenia with CDK in uh, Black patients? It is absolutely true. I do see more neutropenia in uh, Afro-American patients and also some Asian patients. And the reason is when you think about baseline neutropenia, that prevalence is higher in both of these patient populations. So you'll see many you know, young patients, older patients, when you see them for the first time and you do their blood work, their WBC and ANC is much lower than your uh, traditional white patient population. And I think that's where sometimes you know, thinking about abemaciclib over ribociclib or palmociclib might be more attractive, given that they already have baseline neutropenia and you might not be able to necessarily, you know, give them full doses of these drugs. And abemaciclib with slightly lower neutropenia rates, but more diarrhea might be a more attractive patient uh, option. If you have an African-American patient with baseline neutropenia, how do you manage it when it goes down in terms of holding it? Right. So I think I do the same thing that I would do. I would think about maybe depending on the degree of neutropenia, think about maybe a bemaciclib in that patient population. It's not that I would not try a ribociclib in that patient population. They might be fine with the neutropenia not being a big factor, but I would discuss a bemaciclib as well. And then I would dose hold um, because we do do CBCs every two weeks when we start the CDK4-6 inhibitor for the first two months. So we're going to get those values. We'll know exactly what the patients are going to do. We already know what kind of dose reductions we can do on these drugs. We have some data that despite dose reductions, efficacy is maintained. So there is benefit despite the dose reductions that patients might require. So certainly I would follow the same uh, for that patient as well. So I want to go through some scenarios um, and particularly biomarker based. You know, we've been presenting breast cancer cases, cases for a long time with requiring ER and HER2 to be able to present the case. I guess we're in a situation right now for second-line endocrine therapy. you agree that ESR1, PIK3, and AKT needs to be investigated? 
Yes, absolutely. I think now that we have approved therapies for these uh, uh, mutations and these alterations, our approach is biomarker driven in the post CDK46 era. I think we have these biomarkers based on which we can offer therapies. Germline mutations, we have PARP inhibitors. For uh, ASR1 mutants, we have less estrogen. And for the PI3K, AKT, P10, we have Capiva. Pic3 alone, we have um, uh, Alpalisib. So certainly we want to do that because we have standard of care drugs approved for this. So uh, let's try to walk through how you're going to navigate this. I mean, this is really recent because I, I guess it's really the approval of Capiva Sertiv that made this algorithm explode, sort of. And you explained earlier, you know, how you visualize the pathway here. So I guess, you know, this situation of, of first of all, looking at this patient who's relapsing after receiving two years of adjuvant anastrozole, right from the beginning, how are you going to be thinking about a case like that compared to somebody, for example, who presents with metastatic disease? Yeah. So I think, you know, here, uh, this was a patient that two years after starting adjuvant and astrazole received a CDK4-6 inhibit with full vestrin, but stayed on that for 18 months. And then after that has a ESR1 mutation only. And I think we saw that in the Emerald trial that when we compared LSS strand to full vestrin, which was full vestrin naive patients, but there were 30% that had already seen full vestrin there was a benefit to LSS strand. And more importantly, for patients who were on a CDK4-6 for 12 months or 18 months and more, the benefit of single agent LSS trend was much higher than the all-comer patient population. So putting all of that together, given the genomic profile, the durability of a CDK4-6 inhibitor for 18 months, and just ESR1 mutation, I think this is a very appropriate patient who could be treated with LSS trend. Unlike this, if somebody had a progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor in a shorter duration of time, I'm not sure that would have been the best patient for a single agent endocrine-based therapy. What would you be thinking about? So if it's less than six months in the first-line metastatic setting with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, I'm really thinking this is a primary endocrine-resistant tumor. So I'm either looking for a clinical trial with an antibody drug conjugate, or I'm you know, starting them on standard of care single agent chemotherapy, depending on the disease burden and the symptoms, it could be weekly paclitaxel or capecitabine if the disease burden is not that high and I'm okay with an oral agent, which really maintains your quality of life. So I would think about uh, chemotherapy there or look for a clinical trial that might have an antibody drug conjugate. So uh, we vary the situation, and now we're saying not only ESR1, but PIC3. And interestingly, now we see a little, this is how we do consensus conferences. Everybody says the same thing. It's a consensus. Like this? No, nah, this is not a consensus. So only yeah. one person says Alpalissa, but I think that's kind of interesting. But people seem to be split between Elicestrin and CAPI plus endocrine therapy, but it seems like Elicestrin would be better tolerated. Right, right. So I think I think I picked Elicestrin and I picked Elicestrin for that reason. I think the biggest point, the reason you're not seeing a consensus is there cannot be one because this uh, data free zone. We really do not have any head to head trial comparisons to say if one approach is going to be better than the other and what would it look like? I think it'd be very important to understand if we have PFS with Elicestrin what would the PFS look like after LSS trend with combination with, say, Capiva Sertib or Alpalacid or vice versa? And we don't have that. So at this point, because we don't have that, given that the patient was on a CDK4-6 inhibitor for 18 months, seems like has a progressive disease in the bone, has both these mutations, we discuss and think about the toxicity profiles. It seems like LSS trend is very well tolerated with just low-grade nausea. It seems like that might be very appropriate to try and then think about a combination drug, which certainly can be efficacious, but will have more toxicities and be justified at that time point. That's how I think about it. But that's how I would want to discuss that with my patient and see what the patient thinks about it as well. What's your take on what, you know, what's involved with CAPI? You know, the schedule is kind of strange and different. I don't know if that's going to be an issue, but also, and I hear various different yeah. things that, it doesn't, it seems like it does have some tolerability issues. I've heard about mm -hmm. diarrhea, but yeah. what's your experience and what's the literature say? Yeah, no. So I think when you think about alpelacid, 
the two most important things that you worry about and you see in clinic are hyperglycemia and rash. In fact, majority of the discontinuation rates that we had seen were related to hyperglycemia and rash. When we think about capivacertib, we're thinking about diarrhea and rash. We're seeing very less grade three hyperglycemia. And that I think is a, you know, a pain point for community doctors, for academic doctors, because overnight an oncologist is then required to become an endocrinologist and figure out what to do for a patient who might have really terrible grade three or four hypoglycemia. I think oncologists are very comfortable with metformin, but anything beyond that is not necessarily so comfortable to manage. And getting access to specialists in a timely way to help your patient to figure out what to do makes it very, very challenging. And so I think this is why most of us are excited about the fact that with capivacertib, you're going to see less of the hyperglycemia issue. I think with drugs like neratinib, with drugs like abemacyclib, we've all become very big experts in managing diarrhea. In the Capitello trial, there was no primary prophylaxis done for rash. There was no immediate primary prophylaxis for diarrhea. So I think our, our comfort level for diarrhea management is higher. And rash, if we were to start thinking about using primary prophylaxis, so using cetrazine as soon as you start the patient, might perhaps even lower the rates of rash that have been reported on the Capitello 291 study. And I think because of that, there might be more excitement in the community altogether to think about this combination that works not just for PIK3 mutants, but also AKT and P10 alterations when Alpalisib would not work, plus have a slightly distinct toxicity profile that might be slightly better manageable than what we see with Alpalisib. And I think that's really the bias that people are going to have because this drug is approved and now available to us. So incidentally, when we developed uh, these questions uh, with the three variables, uh, my team was like, you, can you really see all these variations? And sometimes you ask stuff, and we, you know, and we were we were waiting to see whether people in this were going to return it and say, "Oh, you can never see this." But I mean, yeah. can you basically see every possibility here? I mean, you were mentioning yes. the one that was a twelve percent, but theoretically, you need to know all three. Yeah. So you know, the all three might be even rare. Is it possible? Certainly possible. So let's let's break it down. What I was saying, twelve percent was ESR1 and P3CA mutation right, together. Right. When we think about the Capitola 9 data set, about 46% had you know, some kind of alteration. Majority of them were PI3K mutants, about over 30%. About 5 to 7% had AKT mutations, about 5 to 7% had P10 mutations. There, about 1% had PI3K and AKT, or PI3K and P10. So is it possible? Yes, it's possible, but even rarer. So having a patient with ESR1, PI3K and AKT, certainly possible, but even, even rarer. So I would say the possibility of ESR1 and PIK3 highest, PIK3 AKT or PIK3 P10 at 1%, and all three possible, but very, very rare. So, you know, one of the things that I've seen in a lot of these second line trials that kind of bothers me is that the control arm, which a lot of times is full vestrant, like the PFS is often really like two months. And like, I'm wondering, like, can we identify these people like this situation where they're all negative and then add on top of it? Can you, particularly in a patient who maybe has some symptoms, can you identify a situation where it's really not worth giving second line endocrine therapy or is it always worth doing? Yeah, no, I think, you know, such a such a great point. I think you raised so many important points here. One, is it ethical now to even have a control arm of full western? I think when these studies were designed, that was very appropriate. But now that we have so many data sets shouting out and saying just single agent full western is a modest PFS of two months, can we even do that to our patients anymore? And, and I think the second point that you raised is, should we just move on to something that might have some real leg and, and give a real progression-free survival benefit and not just a fake two-month benefit with the first scan showing progression, right? I think there are newer therapies um, that are now, you know, um, more impactful, if you will. So if you think about uh, capillocertin and in these altered patient population, you do see seven months. And, and that obviously is more respectable because, you know, it's not two months, it's seven months. Yes, it comes with some toxicity, but it's delaying time to chemotherapy, which is still very, very important to our patients and still a very important 
uh, thing that we try to do for ER positive breast cancer patients. Similarly, when we think about real world data sets with Everolimus, we're seeing about four to five months. So certainly that's a good option that we can see. I showed you the data for oral CERD with Everolimus, with Lunastrand and Everolimus, and that was 16 months. Granted, it's a phase one with 42 patients, but it does seem like maybe with an optimal endocrine backbone and Everolimus, we might actually see something good and it's reasonably tolerated. Our definition of this is a toxic drug has also evolved, right? When Everolimus was approved in 2012, we said it's such a toxic drug, it's such a terrible drug to give. Now of the three drugs, we think that's the easiest in my mind to give because the stomatitis can be handled with the dexamethasone mouthwash. We're not seeing crazy hyperglycemia. We're not seeing crazy diarrhea. We're not seeing crazy rashes. It's really become an easier drug. And so everything is so relative. The CDK46 data beyond progression is an interesting signal. Maintain is a phase two study that did show a signal of 5.2 months in patients who continued um, endocrine-based approaches, but switch of endocrine partner to fulvestrin, switch of CDK from palvo to ribo, and we did see five months. We're waiting for post-monarch and ember-3 to solidify that approach with abema cyclic. So we might have many other tools under our belt beyond the two-month PFS with fulvestrin that we can offer our patients and meaningfully delay chemotherapy. So I think there is still hope, there is still good data that will help us continue this treatment paradigm of what we have been doing, just with different combinations. Although it is interesting now that I look at this graphic here, four people said they would give capecitabine and skip second-line therapy. So even yeah. in that situation, I just want to... Uh, well, uh, pick out a couple other scenarios here. This one I thought was very interesting. Pick three. Nobody wants I to think, give up Pelicid anymore. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, I think the answer to this question was different a few months ago, right? It was absolutely. This, is the, this, was, the, this was the classic case to get people to say Apolism, and now only one person says it. Uh, any uh, thoughts about it? I guess it's related to tolerability, right? Absolutely. It's I all think, about you tolerability. Know, all about tolerability. Alpalacid data set with Solar One was 6% CDK46 uh, patients that had seen CDK. We have Bileave, which was a non randomized phase two study that gave us seven months with Alpalacid post CDK. But the only prospective phase three data set we have is with Capiva, which gave us 7.2 months, but it's the distinct toxicity profile. Very little hyperglycemia grade three, two percent with capiva surtib. I think is the biggest point that people are going to, you know, hope to justify for offering this therapy, and that's why you're seeing this bias amongst all of us who did this survey. 